Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar on search marketing. And um, I'd just like to start the webinar by introducing this beautiful piece behind me by Aviva Reid. Uh, and I'm trying to highlight the um, how much value and um, greatness that artists bring into our lives. Okay. So why does search matter um, as a form of uh, digital marketing? Well, um, to start with, the original architects of the internet, their vision was that you'd sit down at a terminal, type in a question, and then the answers would magically come up. Now, they, as you, you see now in 2020, they've actually built that. Um, but there's, so that, that's also where um, using the internet and technology is moving towards more um, easier control interfaces. So search is a key way of um, finding content. And if you want your content to be found, then um, learning about how search works is very important. The other really important thing that is if somebody's um, searching for you, um, so searching, say, save the Gippsland Forest, for example, um, that means that they're, they're uh, what we call a hot lead. So they're ready to um, engage. They're actually looking for you. So if they're searching for that, and that's a keyword that's related to you, then you definitely need to be ranking on those keywords. Um, and this is versus, uh, say, social media, where you can get your content in front of people, but they may not be engaged or not ready to, um, sort of, they're not searching for it. So um, search is, is a key um, way of marketing. Now, it does have limits, though. Because if nobody's searching for East Gippsland Forest, for example, then there's going to be no, no leads coming through. So it's, um, it's in addition to other forms of marketing. Now, the thing to rem also remember about Google and other search engines is I call it the dark arts in the, in the way that the, um, the rules are published. So what we'll be talking about today and going through um, recommendations of experts is that Google does release bits and pieces here and there, how it works. Um, there's also been a lot of experts that reverse engineer how the technology works. Um, and then there's also um, practitioners that are working on Google rankings. So therefore they're experimenting, they're trying things and they're seeing what's working and what's not. Uh, the thing to always remember is that these rules can shift. So Google does updates um, periodically of their engine uh, as do all search engines. So what can actually happen is you may be ranked really high, a new algorithm comes out and then you drop in rankings. So it's, it's a thing to, to remember that it is what I call dark art. Now, what I'll go through this webinar is um, showing you how to rank for non-competitive keywords. Um, if you're looking to rank for diamond rings, for example, then you would need to get a specialist. And a search engine specialist, I've got a friend uh, that is a search uh, or a marketing consultant. She goes to all the Google conferences um, around the world. Um, she um, stud studied the official Google. Um, so yeah, my friend, uh, she goes to all the conferences. She's done the official Google studies. Uh, she reads the blogs constantly. Um, like this is her life. She loves search marketing. Um, not, uh, I'm not that immersed in it. So I'm, I'm more working at a basic level. So if you've got really competitive keywords, then you need to go to a specialist that is living this life, living and breathing search marketing. Now I also put a big warning. There's a massive amount of cowboys out there, especially in the Australian market. So there's a lot of people that may um, read some blogs, call themselves a search expert, and they'll, they'll be making heaps of money. Um, the ACCC at the moment is doing investigation into Australian search companies because there's a lot of people um, charging the wrong fees, um, rorting people um, and really taking advantage of people's naivety. So in that context, even if you are working with um, a specialist or outsourcing to a consultant, I'm hoping that this, this session will then help you understand what you're actually doing with them. And so therefore that you, you'll be able to find a search marketer that will help with you. I've also got another friend that's um, running a cleaning business and search marketing is a key um, driver for his business. And he's gone through like handfuls of search on marketers because as a business owner, he's learned about search marketing and 
as he gets smarter at it, he's realizing that his suppliers aren't quite up to scratch or they're not good at this. And so he's, he, he's finding ones that actually do what they need to do. So bear that in mind. Also within uh, the dark arts of search optimization is lots of dodgy things that people can do. Um, one extreme case is they may hack someone's website and then put in search um, keywords back to their website. Um, that's an extreme case, but there are a lot of dubious, gray, not quite right ways of search marketing. Now, if Google catches you doing these things, you get put in the sandbox. Now, this is the naughty box. Um, usually it's for six months. Um, so that means that you won't rank on Google for six months. So if you're working with somebody or you're reading on the blog, something that doesn't quite sound right or sounds a little bit, um, bit dodgy, I recommend ignoring it and just don't do it because the current algorithm may rank you really high in Google, then the new algorithm, it sandboxes you and you're out of the game. So um, there's, a, there's a, a process of doing good search optimization um, and there are a few tricks to help you rank, um, but you, you're, um, the, the, it's the basics that you need to really look at and really focus on the basics. And I'll go through the basics today. Um, are the notifications that you're sandboxed? Um, I can't answer that question. You have to research. It's been a while since I've looked into that. Um, my assumption is no, I think they just like cut you. Um, but yeah, you'd need to look into that. Okay, another important concept to think about with search optimization is how competitive. And by that is how many people are working for your search keywords. So the example I've got there is diamond rings. So if you want to rank number one for diamond rings, you're going to be spending forty to hundred thousand dollars a month in various techniques to rank on that. Um, simply because there's other people spending such huge amounts of money that are um, ranking for that term. Because the thing is, if you rank number one for diamond rings, you click through, there's a massive profit margin on diamond rings. Um, and it, you know, the market, the capitalist market dictates that price. Now, if you're going to optimize for Coburg soccer club, so your local um, amateur soccer club, you're likely to be the only one that's going to rank for that. So therefore there is no competition and um, you should easily rank. So if you follow what we go through today, then you should be able to rank number one um, for Kobex Soccer Club. The other thing to, that's important as well is a lot of people think that number one result is the most important. And I disagree with that. I really think that page number one is essential. It's pretty rare that people will search from pay, from into the second page or third page. So you really have to be on the first page. I think if you're ranked in the top three, four or five links, then um, that is just as good as being the first link. The reason is, is, and if you think about how you search, generally you're trying to find what you're looking for. So generally you'll type into the search engine, the results will come up and then you'll, you'll just glance at the results. So you'll look at the first few at the top and go, mm, which one do I want to search on? And we'll talk a little bit later about optimizing um, those snippets that display in Google. So therefore you can rank a bit higher. Uh, and so there's a huge amount of opportunity if you're looking for non-competitive uh, approaches to search engines. Okay, so I'm just going to share screen and um, show you the difference between pay uh, organic and non-organic is a really key um, concept. So I'm going to use the uh, example today, WordPress Training Melbourne, because that's something that I've optimized heavily for in my, um, my previous business that's now rolled into um, action skills. So this is a Google search results. I've typed in WordPress Training Melbourne. And what I've come up with in the first two um, things, uh, it's got ad written here on the side. So these are people that are paying for ads. Um, so here's a tip. If you're really upset with property lawyers, then you can search Google for property lawyers and then you can just click on all the ads and that will then be costing those property lawyers probably 10 to $20 per click. Um, now if we go down, um, we also have the Google map results. Um, and then we have the results here, the actual Google results. So this is what we call organic. Now, by organic, we mean that it's, it's, it's come up to the top on its own merit. 
So therefore, Google thinks that this is the best thing that you used to, um, that the, the best page for you. Versus these are the ones which are sort of the best page for you, but they're paid ads. Um, okay, so that's a really important distinction between organic and paid advertising. Now they both have their role. So if you're starting a campaign, sometimes search optimization in an organic context can take a couple of weeks, sometimes a couple of months to rank. And if it's a little bit competitive, it may take you a lot of work. So if you're launching a campaign, you may stick some um, money on budget onto the ad Google AdWords. So then you can start getting your, your um, campaign or uh, whatever up the top until you've had enough time to do organics. Another um, good, uh, use of ads is when I was running my commercial training courses, I was ranking here. I was ranking number three between two and three. Now I'm down a little bit because I haven't been doing much work. So, but what I do is when I was running my actual courses in the lead up, then I'd actually run an ad as well, just to make sure I was right at the top. Now the good news for not for profits is that Google gives you 10,000 US dollars for free of Google AdWords. So that's correct, $10,000 of free AdWords. So that means that you can, um, you know, look at all your um, uh, related keywords for your campaign and start paying advertising on them. And so you're ranking on them. Now, there are some restrictions, like for example, the thin green line who um, raise money for really brave, uh, awesome rangers that are on the front line in Africa. And unfortunately, um, there's quite a high death toll of um, these awesome humans that are on the front line protecting the animals. Now, there's certain terms they won't let you use, such as elephant and lion and tiger. Now, these sort of keywords are key to uh, the thin green line because that's the animals they're actually protecting. And so it makes sense to optimize for them. So the, there is some um, restrictions. So um, in addition to what I'm teaching you today, um, the Google AdWord grant is really a, a good option for not-for-profits. And, um, but it does take a bit of work to get it set up. So it may be um, a case of um, bringing in an expert for a little bit to get the system set up um, and then, then you can just run them. And that's 10,000 10, every month for forever. Now to get those um, grants, um, so basically there's this organization called TechSoup um, in the States and they manage not-for-profit licenses, including the Google ones. So they do all the paperwork and the admin for the not-for-profit. Um, so Google doesn't have to bother about it. Um, now connecting up is Australia's version of that. And um, they also have heaps of other discounts. Um, so if we look here, um, there's Adobe, um, there's Amazon Web Services, et cetera, et cetera. Um, things like Canva are discounted through the system. Um, you can also buy new computers and all that sort of stuff. So check out uh, Connecting Up uh, and specifically the, um, the not-for-profit credits for Google, which you can get a link there. Google is the undisputed uh, dominant player in the search market. Um, and there's some negatives to that, but we won't go through that in this webinar. There is also other search engines to think about. Um, Yahoo, for example, which is an old school, maybe some of the older people in the webinar may um, know, have heard of those. There's also Bing. Um, now Bing is Microsoft. And so when Microsoft saw the huge um, success and power that Google had, they put in massive resources into their search engine. And because they've got different business relationships and they own an operating system. So Bing um, is also uh, worth paying attention to within your um, search. Then there's also Beidou and Yandex. So that's a Chinese search engine and a Russian search engine. Now it makes sense that if you're um, targeting a um, Chinese or Russian uh, market, then they're important um, search engines to think about. And I'm also gonna add another um, construct um, to the search um, uh, variables out there and that's privacy. So there's a lot of people that are getting really upset about Google's incessant tracking and some of the sinister sides of this search engine. So a lot of people are adopting um, private search engines like start page is what I'm using. Um, so that also bear that in mind as well as that um, there's people that are looking for more privacy focused searches. Now, as well as the actual standard search engine you type in, the world's second largest search engine on the internet is YouTube. 
So Google gets the most searches on the internet, then YouTube gets the second amount. So um, it, that's interesting also to think of with your videos and your content and when you're planning about your content about um, YouTube actually being a search engine. And then, um, so if, you're, if you put the, the YouTube or the video content aside, if you think about search optimization in a YouTube context and then how that can connect with your campaign. So um, if, we're, if you're talking about the pathways that we were talking about in previous webinars, so you'd go uh, YouTube, they search for a keyword, up comes your video, which is made purely for the search results, which then can click connect down to your website. Uh, and in a modern context, something that's really important now is voice search. So the whole, hey Google, can you search for me on something? Um, or hey, um, Amazon's got one. And um, there's a massive race for the big tech companies to get into your home with these um, voice activated um, computers. If you saw 1984, you may see the power of these systems and why they're scrambling to get there. Uh, okay, so uh, um, a key concept with search optimization um, and is that there is a distinction between humans and robots. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to game the robot so we can get in front of the human. Um, and so it's really important to focus on both of those. So I'll be talking a little bit about technical structure and how to optimize for robots and talking very robotic in some, some ways because it's um, a system does it because Google's a robot. And so therefore we're trying to get that robot to find us and think that we're good. But in that context, never forget site that we're actually designing ultimately for humans who will click on the link and then come to your website. And I'm sure you may have um, come across websites in the past that have been search optimized and um, they're quite obviously written for robots and they just feel really not, not great and um, look a bit cheap and sleazy in that context. Okay, any questions so far? Okay, we do have some questions. Do you need to be DGR or registered with an ABN? Okay, so this is a question um, regarding TechSoup. And yes, um, you don't have to be a DGR. So what DGR is, is means that you're, you're registered as an Australian charity that can get a tax deduction. So if people um, donate to you, they can get a deduction. Uh, I don't know exact rules, but I think it's an um, association, not for profit. Um, so it's far looser than the DGR. Um, but you have to prove that you are a um, not-for-profit or non-government organisation. Um, and I think that your ABN will register that. So when, you, when you're registered as an ABN, then um, there's different types, whether you're PTY or a sole trader, um, a limited association. So there's all these different levels. So don't quote me on it, but my understanding is if you put your ABN in there and you're registered as a, um, an organisation that's um, set up for not-for-profit type, um, uses then you should be able to get get that um, the other thing you can think about is you may um, auspice so there may be another organization that you work with that does have access to TechSoup or to connecting up I should say so therefore you might go well we want to get some software licenses um, for our organization can you just um, put them under your name and pop you I didn't tell you to do that but um, that's sort of one way around that okay so how do search engines work Okay, so the first thing um, to think about is that search engines need to index your site, index the content. So if you've ever been to Google, you may um, be desensitized to it, but you'll notice how quickly you, when you search the results come up. Now that is actually quite a, an amazing concept because it searched millions of pages and just instantly come up with a the uh, the right one. So the way that, that Google and other search engines do is they have what they call crawl bots. And they, they're robots that just crawl the internet. They follow links and they follow links and then they start, um, they start copying your web pages to their server. So at that point, as they're indexing, then they're also just taking the bits that they want. So it's a bit like, um, you know, an almond tree. They're just grabbing the little almonds and leaving the rest of the tree there. Um, getting the bits that they want to search. Um, and it's a lot obviously more complex than that. So um, they're not actually searching the internet live. It's always a few days behind. 
and um, the search engines do prioritize modern uh, contemporary content. So for example, they'll probably index media pages more regularly daily or um, social media more regularly, but for standard web pages, they can be quite a little bit out of date. So the key um, thing for your optimization is that you need to be indexed. That's the first thing. All right, so I'm gonna to jump to uh, Moz, moz.com. Now Moz is a great place um, and I, this is your homework. And I recommend that anybody that's doing anything with digital reads this guide. This is a great guide. Um, basically what it's done is it's, they've got a whole heap of expert search marketers and I've um, put this guide together for beginners. Now, um, Moz has a lot of really advanced um, tutorials for getting into it, So, but I'm just gonna quickly introduce this guide. And specifically, I'm not gonna go through this guide because obviously that you can go back and do that as part of your homework, but I'm just going to talk to this diagram. And this is their hierarchy of SEO needs. So at the bottom is the most important, going up to the top. And so at the bottom, we've got crawl accessibility. So what that means is, is that you need your website to be able to be ranked, to be able to be indexed. So um, there's a bit of code in a website that says, talks to the robots. And it says, yes, robots, you're welcome into my website, or no, robots, go away. So now that's not a um, secure um, approach, but robots will respect that. I mean, why would Google index a website that doesn't want index? Because it just, um, it takes waste resources. So it's very important to check the setting on your website um, that it's indexed. So in WordPress, for example, it's in the reading settings, there's a checkbox, can Google index my site or not? Now, if you've got robots switched off, so you're saying go away robots, then you won't get indexed and you won't be on search results. That is the most key important thing, um, obvious reasons. So the next thing up on the um, pyramid is compelling content. So I, I um, frame it a little bit differently. I think you need to create the best page on the internet. So if you're optimizing for WordPress training Melbourne, you need to create the best page on the entire internet that is about WordPress training in Melbourne. So if you're uh, optimizing for the Gippsland forests, then you need to create the best page on the internet for Gippsland forest. Um, and I'll get into that in a bit. But if you think about the basic concept of what we're trying to do here is a user or a person who's gone to a search engine because they're looking for a Gippsland forest, type that in, they're looking for the best page on the internet. So if you've, if you've made the best page, then they will, Google will go and, and find you. So amongst all of the stuff that I'm gonna talk through today, if you're unsure about anything, just revert back to this one thing, make the best page on the internet for your subject. And of course, make sure that you're letting robots come and index it. So if you've got the best page on the internet and robots are indexed, can come and get it, then you're pretty much most of the way of uh, optimizing your website for search engines. Okay, so we've got really good content. The next one is that we need to optimize for keywords. Now this is really the uh, old school, this is the way that um, search optimization's always been. So for example, keywords, Gippsland, forests. Um, so they're the, the words that people are searching for. So therefore you need those words in your page. And I'll talk in a lot more detail about keywords and choosing them and where to put them. Then the next thing is a great user experience. So um, Google's getting smarter on how websites work. So um, simple layouts, um, fast speed load times, um, works on multiple devices, those sort of things. And Google will be very judgy about those things. And if your website is an awful mobile experience in the robot's opinion, then it won't put you high on the rankings for a mobile search. Shareworthy content. And um, I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a little bit. Um, so basically your, um, it's using social proof for your content. So if you're, um, you're the best page for Gippsland Forest and everybody's sharing it and it's gone uh, really wildfire through social media, 
then Google knows that humans have been sharing that and the social proof that that's the best page and so it ranked. So um, that's another reason why running social media in parallel with search optimization is important because they both, um, the search, the social media um, marketing actually helps with your search ranking. Um, and title URL description, I'm gonna go through that in a bit of details as well. So that's the same as keywords. And then right at the top is schema markup. Um, I'm gonna skip that, but just um, for your, just to, that, for your information, what that is, is you know, if you type in um, weather Melbourne, and it'll come up with the actual weather um, snippets, or if you type in um, conversion um, pounds to euros, you'll actually come up with those conversions. The way that works is that um, there's a special um, type of code that you can um, put in your web page. So if you're a certain type of result, like the weather or um, stock market prices or something like that, and then Google will grab your web page, grab that bit of code, stick it at the top, and then link back. So that's really for more advanced websites. So it's not really um, for a sort of beginner campaign website. Okay, so I do recommend if you go just to Moz, um and you go to resources so moz.com and beginner's guide to seo um so i recommend that everybody reads that thoroughly and understands it so i'm going to talk about link backs now what a link back is is websites that link back to your website so this was the this was the original social proof that search engines and when google first came to the um market it was the link back um, approach that really made them an event search engine so the concept is the more websites that link back to you the better more social proof so i'm going to also um, explain it in a little bit more of an advanced way and i want you to think of a schoolyard all the kids in the schoolyard okay so we've got tom now tom is a bit of a popular kid all the other kids think he's really cool so tom has 20 friends that link back to him. So in that context, Google goes, oh, look at Tom. He's got 20 friends that link back to him. He's gonna go higher up in the search ranking. That makes sense. Now there's also another concept that comes in and this is called page rank. So the equivalent is there's Sally. Sally's only got five friends. But see, Sally's five friends, uh, one of them's a, a music promoter, one of them, owns a really fancy car. One of them is in a rock band and the other one is cool as well. And Google's going, hang on, Sally only has five friends, but they're so much more, they're better friends than um, Tom. So therefore she ranks higher than Tom because her friends are far more um, cooler in Google's eyes. So what pay, So the, there's an actual um, measurement called PageRank and there's various plugins that you can plug into your browser. So if you visit a website, you can see what PageRank it is. So it's important um, once you've built the best page on the internet is to get then people to link back to it. So you want as many pages linking back to your website as possible. Um, and also with link backs, you also want to use the keyword that you're optimizing for. So if you're optimizing for Gippsland Forest, you actually want someone to write on their web page, not just oh, check out this great website. Think back, you want to go check out this great website on Gippsland Forest and make Gippsland Forest the link, that keyword, because then that um, tells, reinforces Google that that link is for that keyword back to that page. Um, so as well as just getting as many link backs to your website as possible, you, you want to be looking at ones with high page rank. Um, and so that's obviously a lot harder to do because websites with more page rank are less likely to link link to you. Um, so part of your so part of search optimization is always running a link back um, campaign. And so that'll be uh, so a basic for a small organisation would be to like let's just brainstorm any related organisations that would maybe link to us. Um, and we did network mapping in one of the earlier um, webinars. So this is really a key um, approach is look at your network mapping to see what associations, what networks would um, help link. Um, forums and things like that are really important. Um, there's online directories. Uh, and also blogs are really key. And an advanced approach to link backs is that the really high end um, companies that offer search optimization services, they've actually gone and bought 
really high ranking um, websites such as blogs and media. And they rank them and they, they keep funding them and um, they'll pay the journalists and they keep running these blogs as um, really high quality content. The, the business um, mo motive for them isn't selling advertising, like the standard way of thinking about it, nor is it to profit off anything else. They purely are now using that asset as page rank. So then when a client um, pays them to rank high, they've got all these different websites where they'll then put a backlink onto their high ranked websites back to the client's website and ranks them up. So if you've got other organizations in your network that are a bit more switched on with digital marketing, then you can start doing um, cross shares and those sort of things. Um, but it's super, super key to um, have link backs to your website. Um, two reasons, one um, for, for what I've just explained. And the second reason is that when Google's crawling the internet, the more times it comes across you, it's more chance you'll get indexed. And as I mentioned at the start, you can't get your website found unless you're indexed. And so you want as much of your website indexed as possible. Now, sometimes Google is a little bit fussy, like a child eating dinner, and might only eat a bit of your website, maybe only index a bit of it. So the more links coming back to your website, the more different meals that Google will have to, to index different parts of your website. So the two come hand in hand. And I'll just, oh yep, so I'm not sharing screen. Okay, so I did mention earlier to make the best page on the internet. Um, and I'm also going to make a prediction that artificial intelligence will mean the death of SEO. And what I mean by that is that if you've made the best page on the internet, Google will be soon in the future smart enough to know that that's the best page and it will link to it automatically. In the short term, Google's not that smart. So therefore you need to use keywords, we need to use link packs, we need to do all those things. Um, but I do uh, visage in the future that it's, that's going to be a thing of the past. Okay. Any questions? Um, okay. What about links from your other Facebook, other social media accounts? Yes. Um, I sort of would put social media slightly different um, because Google and search engines see social media in a different construct. They, they're seeing um, social media more of a live um, aggregation. So it's, it's super important to have link backs onto your social media. So that's definitely something that you'll be doing um, when you're launching new pages and campaigns is posting them on your social media and then um, hopefully getting uh, other people and influencers in your network to be also posting your links. But you also need to um, see it as a parallel channel of social media links, but then also actual hard website links, um, other assets on the website that's going to link back. Now, if you're um, a decent sized thing, then you can also uh, look at getting a Wikipedia page. Um, I, the, the thing with, um, there's also a code on the internet that's called no follow. And what that means is, is that certain websites will link back to you. So Eventbrite, for example, will do this because Eventbrite, if you've had a look, if you've ever searched for sort of keywords that are related, then uh, um, Eventbrite just comes up number one for, for a lot of things. That's a really good SEO. So if you add, uh, if you create an event which is optimized for those keywords and then put your link back, which in theory would be very good page rank and good link back, They've put a bit of code in all their links, which says no follow. And what that means is it tells Google and other search engines to say, don't give this um, link any page rank. Um, we're going to link to it. That's fine. Someone can click on it, but don't give it any page rank. So um, when you are looking at link, link backs, if you're um, arranging link backs with other people, then just check that there's no follow on that link. You can right, right mouse click and have a look at that. Um, and if you're, if you're trying to game things like Eventbrite and that, they'll just simply not let you do it. Um, so just bear in mind that little um, a bit of code. Okay. Selecting target keywords. So this is really the first place to start. And um, so what keywords um, should you optimize for? And if you've got a campaign, um, Gippsland's Forest, um, and I'm using that as a simple um, example. People may not be searching for Gippsland Forest. So then we can be looking at some other things that we can be optimizing. 
So the first thing is to ask is what is your target audience searching for? And we did um, targets and character personas in earlier webinars and getting our head around like in the audiences. So the first thing that we usually, uh, the, that's important to understand is that if nobody's searching for a keyword, then it doesn't matter. Like if you, if you rank number one on Google for pink pepper dot, dots in the Gippsland forest, great. But no one's searching for that, so it doesn't matter. So when searching for your keywords, you need to actually find keywords that people are actually searching for. That's really important because again, ranking on something that no one wants, there's no one looking for, then it's, there's no point in that. The other thing is to make sure things are, that are, are relevant to your subject. So just say that I rank number one for Justin Bieber, and, um, which would be hard to do, um, but just say I, I did that. But then people click from Justin Bieber down to the Gippsland Forest, and Justin has no, um, he's done no activism, has no, no links, it's completely irrelevant. So that means that person's gonna go from, to our website and just bounce off, and it's just totally a waste of time. So it's also, doesn't make sense to um, optimize for irrelevant keywords and keywords that are not um, searched for. Okay, so a key um, concept when talking about keywords is what we call short tail and long tail. So this is jargon, so I'm gonna explain. So short tail is a very short keyword, diamond rings, um, forest. So it's a very short, and so therefore it's very competitive. However, there's also a lot more searches for it. So if I search for training, just straight training, there's gonna be like 10,000 searches a, um, a month on that, um, but it's also not really that relevant and it's also highly competitive. So if we then jump to Diamond Rings Coburg or um, Forest Gippsland, it's much more um, specific. That's what we call a long tail. And long tails can also become quite long. So the idea is that if you um, choose really targeted keywords and if there's a few searches for them and you've got a few of those long tails, they add up to be substantial traffic. Um, I'll get to the, that question in a little bit, Sally. Um, so it's really, really important to start looking at the long tail um, approaches. Um, so for example, early example I used was uh, Coburg so soccer because Coburg's a local area um, soccer team rather than soccer team. Okay, now where we usually start is um, I usually will start guessing. Like, what would I search to find this? What what do I think other people would use to, to search this? Um, I would also be saying um, to my friends and other people I'm working with, what would you search? If you're looking for a campaign on the Gippsland Forest, what would you search for? Um, so then you start compiling those lists. Then the next step is that you actually test that and then um, compile a list. So I'm gonna to jump to the Google Keyword Planner. Here we go, Google Keyword. Now, a lot of the time, now basically this is a tool that's added onto the Google Ads. So at the start I discussed the difference between um, paid ads and organic ads. Um, but what we do is we use the, so Google has this tool to help you um, choose the best keywords for advertising, but because ads and, and organics are sort of the same keywords, um, we can use that tool. Now, sometimes uh, it makes you put a credit card in. Um, in this account, um, this specific account, I had a credit card and then I disconnected the credit card and it still lets me use it. Um, so if you're worried about, they, don't, they won't charge you unless you um, actually buy advertising. Um, so maybe if you search, there, there used to be ways of getting around it without a credit card to use this tool. Um, but if you do force to use a credit card, then you may just delete it as soon as you've, you've got access to the system. Um, so Google Keyword Planner, hang on, I've come to it here. Okay, so I'm going to get search volumes and um, forecasts. So we go, so I'm going to go WordPress training Melbourne and get started. And you can see at the top, my account is inactive, but it doesn't matter because I'm just using the tool. I don't want to run ads on this yet. Okay, so WordPress Training Melbourne. 
Now I'm going to look up the top. Now we can see at the top here, locations Australia. So that's really key if you um, are trying to target Pacific areas. So um, I might actually target Melbourne. Um, so if I'm specifically looking for, um, so you can see here for these keywords, it's like uh, I, the number for Melbourne is obviously a lot smaller. Um, but if I'm purely targeting Melbourne, then there's no, I don't care what they're searching for in Perth. But it depends what you're trying to do. If you're a national campaign, then um, sure. But you also don't really want to be looking at data from China or America if you're optimizing for Australia. Um, okay, so this is, um, okay, so this is saying how much the ad costs. I'm, Going to actually jump out of this screen. Sorry, I jumped into the wrong screen. I want to go to discover new keywords. Apologies. Um, so I'm going to do the same thing. My computer will work. Uh, WordPress training. Now I'm not going to put Melbourne because I'm going to just have a play. Be in Melbourne here. Uh, WordPress training. Now I can also put a domain in. Um, so in that case, you may put, um, you may go to search for the term and see what number one is and then stick, stick that in there. Or you could test other websites like your competitors or your website just to see what comes up. And then in here we come through. Okay, so obviously Melbourne training WordPress, you know, Melbourne's getting a million um, views but that's not really relevant to us. So then we can um, start to have a look at what it's doing here. So these are all sort of talking about unrelated keywords. So I'm gonna then put in, um, they're, they're too vague. So I'm gonna put in actual word press training and get results. Okay, WordPress training. Average monthly searches in Melbourne, in Australia and Melbourne. Okay, I don't want Australian ones. I'm gonna take off the Australian. Oh, see how that um, changed my data. All right, so WordPress training in Melbourne, there's 10 to 100 monthly searches. So that seems low, 10 searches. But if I'm um, doing a commercial training, um, my, I'd only sell probably eight tickets and I'd run them every, every quarter. So if I can get eight, eight sales from, from WordPress training keyword, then that's actually quite lucrative. So 10 to hundred is, it works in that context. So if, you, if I also then had a group of different keywords and then I had about six of them and they all got um, 10 searches each, that's 60 searches per month. Okay, so if I'm looking at this screen as well, we're having a look at, on the right column here, um, the bids. So this means that um, if you bid for an ad, so if I bid $6.62, so basically, um, just say you've got a budget of $100 on AdWords, and you bid on the high end, that means that you'll outbid your competitor and you'll be, num you'll be the top ad. If you bid the lower range and your competitors outbid you, then you go down the down the range. Now, this figure is very useful to see how things are competitive. So if I'm running a course um, at the time, it makes sense for me to, to pay, and this is $4, say $1.54 for a click. But it does make good business sense for me to spend uh, $4 a click um, when I'm selling my training tickets. Um, so it just, it makes business sense. So in your case, if you're using free Google AdWords, then that becomes less of an issue, right? Because it's not costing you anything. Um, this gets up to $16 a link. Um, uh, obviously at the moment we've got COVID, so no one's running in-person training, so no one's optimizing for it. Um, so there's nothing else here that's interesting. WordPress training, um, we're all just talking about things which are Melbourne. So I'm just going to then redo the test, um, take off Melbourne. Um, get results, see if I can get anything. Okay, so here we go. This is really interesting. Now I'm starting to look at the uh, related stuff. WordPress course, there's 10 to 100. WordPress online course, da, 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 da. 
So what I what I do is the first step is that you guess all the keywords that someone may try to find your campaign. Um, sometimes questions are really useful. Um, type them all in and then start looking at what those results are. Now, and then what I do is I make a spreadsheet. So you can export this or you can just cut and paste it. So you want to write your keywords in the spreadsheet. Now, the keywords that go up are the ones which get the most searches. So if you optimize for a keyword and you get number one for something that gets a thousand searches, that's far more powerful than something that gets 10 searches, obviously just the numbers. But then you also want to, um, the stuff that's more relevant go higher up. So you may have let, uh, something that's only getting 10 searches, but it's really, really super relevant. So that will go up on the list. So then basically you're just floating up and down relevancy and voice search volume. And so you, you write your word and the volume. Now, if you are running ad campaign, um, or if you're, if it, if you're interested, if that, the actual numbers of the, what people are paying for ads is useful, then also put that in the column. So for example, if you're doing a certain campaign, say, um, an economic campaign, um, so boycott a certain company, it would be very interesting to see what um, people are paying for certain keywords and stuff like that as part of your strategy. So then by the end of this process, you'll then have um, a spreadsheet with a whole bunch of keywords um, and then they'll be ranked by rele relevancy and for search volume. Any questions there? Okay, cool. So I'm just going to now jump to this website. Um, now this is a commercial version of um, the search term of the keyword um, planner. Um, oh, and sorry, I'll just before I'm there, I'm just going to jump to another, um, just another quick thing. Um, if I type in WordPress, so see um, in just the, this is just the Google search. See how it's got all these suggestions. So they're also keywords to stick in um, because they're the, they're, Google is using all of its data to predict what somebody's searching for. So therefore it's, it's what Google thinks people are searching for. So it makes sense. So you'd use a mixture of this and that Google keyword tool um, to be able to um, start building your lists. Um, and Cherie's also mentioned negative keywords are also important. That's correct. Um, now I'm just going to jump back to Ahrefs. So there's a few tools which are commercial um, tools that, that um, are far more advanced than that Google search. Um, now the reason I'm showing you this one is that it's um, there's a handful that are far better than the others. Um, and if you search for um, uh, keyword search tools, um, best keyword you, you'll be able to find some of the other competitors. The reason I like this one is because they've got a seven day trial for $7. So that means if you're starting a campaign, each time you start a campaign, you only need a fresh credit card to start the seven day trial. And in seven days gives you enough time to do all of your keyword research, to get all your strategy in place and to do all the things um, for seven bucks, which is, is quite good value. Um, because then the pricing goes quite up. I think they're like $80 or $90 a month. Um, ongoing. So if you're a commercial business um, to that relies heavily on search marketing, then that's a cost you'd pay. But for obviously not for profit, you could just pay the one off seven bucks, get your strategy in place, and then you may revisit it every now and then. Now, if you revisit it every now and then, then you just use a different credit card so you can get the get the trial. Um, so uh, now the benefit of this over Google is that you can type in your competitors and what they'll do is they'll do an analysis. Um, so if you've got another campaign that's um, very similar to yours, um, so competitors, the wrong word, but your allies, um, if you're looking at, um, if you're doing like a boycott campaign, you may be looking at um, the, the target that you're trying to boycott, what their keywords are, those sort of things. Um, it will help you with um, keyword research. So that process that I've just done. Backlink research is really important because you could type in an ally or competitor and see what websites link back to them. And then you could look at them and go, hey, they're likely to link back to me too. So then you can contact them. Um, so backlink research is really um, valuable because that will help you find sites that will help link you back. Um, these tools also help you with content, which, which is also key for um, search optimization. The rank tracking is the um, page ranking that I was talking about and uh, all that sort of stuff. So they, these tools are 
you know, the next level up. And I do recommend um, playing with these if you can afford them. Okay, so now that we've got our keyword list, we need to now, for every keyword that we're optimizing for, we need a page or a post. Now, when I say that to a lot of people, they're like, but we've got this long amount of keywords, there's heaps of them, like, you want me to make a page for every single one? I'm like, yes, that is the game, that's what we're doing. Now, in saying that though, you can group stuff. So Google is getting smarter. So for example, WordPress Training um, Melbourne, I rank for WordPress short courses, Melbourne, even though I haven't optimized for it because Google's smart enough to see that these are linked keywords. So you can get away with like grouping the keywords if they've got the same meaning. However, I recommend that if you really want to rank on a specific key keyword, then you make a page for it. Um, so your search optimization strategy may not be done overnight. It might be like, okay, so we're going to just build the first really important handful of pages that are really important keywords. And then we're going to put that list, the other keywords onto our contents, content schedule, which we'll talk about tomorrow. And then when you're producing content for social media and for other things, feeding your know, digital marketing um, and talking to your community, you're like, all right, well, we need a page for this this keyword so um let's let's write a page about that and then you then you, you build them over time um so yes you need a page or a post for those keywords and i'll sh and we'll show you how to optimize for that a bit later it needs to be quality content remember i keep saying it's going to be the best page on the internet for that for that um keyword um if you're just going to build just a crappy page just because you're doing search optimization which that's the way it used to be done. Google's gonna go, yeah, you don't, you don't care about this keyword. You've just made a crappy page. We just don't care about it. Um, you need to have, um, okay, so then you also need a search result title and description. So, sorry, I'll just jump back to share screen to show you what I mean by that. Um, so if I jump back to Google. So this thing here, this is the search result, the Google search result. So, um, so we've got a title and we've got a description, we've got a link. So for every optimized keyword, you need to also optimize the, um, this description. And the reason is, is that just say you've done a really good job and you've ranked uh, number three, or in this case, what am I? One, two, three, four, five, six, oh, seven. That's not very good, but say I've ranked seven. Now I, the robot's got me there. Now I need to connect, get a human to tick on it. So um, WordPress training course, the one above me, learn WordPress from industry experts, da, 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 da. That sounds really exciting. So I might click on it. This one here sounds really exciting. So I might click on it. Okay, Digital Melbourne Agency. WordPress training is standard inclusion in Moo's website development service, which allows our clients to make updates. That's not very exciting. So if you're ranked high on that, and then a human is choosing between um, which link to click on. This is extremely key bit of information. And then also a call to action. Um, and that comes back to our, our original strategy. So the idea is that you're, um, you're using the search marketing to get in front of somebody. They've clicked to your page. Now once they're at the page, what's the next step? You want them to do something now. What is that next thing that you want them to do? So it's really key for every every keyword that you've got is that you're making um, a call to action on that page. So in summary, um, it is quite a bit of work to um, produce so many pages for all your keywords. However, you also need to produce all this content for your social marketing um, and just to build, build a good website for your campaign. So it's an ongoing thing. So um, that's something that's planned. Hey, okay, we're back. And I hope you had a good rest because we are going to now get a little heavy and we're going to be talking about optimizing copy and possibly semantic markup. And um, I'm going to go through some um, technical code um, sort of stuff. And uh, the important thing to remember in all of this is that if you do this work while building web pages, it's actually no extra work. Once you, once you learn the techniques of writing clean copy, then you don't, then it's actually easy. Whereas if you have to go and then grab a website and then retrospectively tidy it all up and optimize for search engines, it's actually a really big job. 
So it's really important to learn this stuff as you go. So therefore you can just implement it as you go. So a semantic markup, what semantic markup is, is it's computer readable text. So it's really important um, in context to search engines because Google is a robot. So therefore we want the robot to be able to read the text. Now the, the good news is it's also a simplified format. So if it's easier for robots to read, then it's also easier for humans to read. And I'm a big fan of making things as simpler and easy as possible. So where we're going to start with is the basic structure of um, what a website is, uh, the, the code of a website. Now, all websites um, are built, jump back to the run sheet, um, out of HTML. So basically, HTML was the first language. So this is a language that your browser reads. So if you're using Google um, Chrome or um, Firefox or something like that, this is the language that your um, browser is reading. Now, um, that was the first language. And then um, in recent times, we've also added another two languages. One is called Castigating Style Sheets. And what that it does is it separates the content from the styling. So therefore CSS is the fonts, the colors, the layouts, all that sort of stuff. And that's really important to good semantic markup because it means that the, the design and the aesthetic code is not within, within the actual content. And that's really important if you're gonna then push that content to different devices, because then you may have different styling depending on the device. Um, so you have HTML plus, which is the content, plus the CSS, which is the, um, the styling and then another language called JavaScript, which then does more um, dynamic stuff, animation. You know, when you uh, pre, pre filled out forms, the capture forms, all that's running on JavaScript. So the good news is, is that HTML is a simple language. And um, this is uh, just a link to really introduction. So if we have a look at this example here and I'll just uh, increase the size, H1, uh, so left bracket, H1, right bracket, my first setting. So everything in between. And then we close it with this uh, forward slash. That is the start of H1, that's the end of H1. So it's just, it is actually quite a simple language. So um, that's why I urge people that are scared of code, don't be scared of this one. It's not, that's not as scary as you may think. Um, so this is paragraph and end paragraph. And so if we jump down to some other, here's a heading one, heading two, heading three. Um, this is what a link looks like. So what we're trying to do here is get to you to the level of um, how you manage your automobile. So I'm not wanting you to be able to be a mechanical engineer and design engines. I'm not wanting you to be a mechanic where you um, change the rings on your motor or fix the alternator. But I am expecting you to be able to lift the bonnet and to check the water and the oil. I'm also expecting that if your car breaks down, that you lift the bonnet and you look and go, why would that be broken? Or hang on, that thing that's gushing water, maybe the problem. Or hang on, that belt thing that's broken, don't know what it is or what it does. Yeah, that's probably the problem. So that's as far as you need to know. So if you think of that analogy, um, but if you're too scared to lift the bonnet, um, you may cook your motor. Um, or in this case, um, have bad optimization and something much more worse to a coder is a bad code. Um, okay, so, um, and this is a list here. So this is an unordered list. So we start the list, we end the list, um, list item, list, close that list item, da da da. So I'm going to, um, so most software tools that build websites will give you a HTML mode or a code mode. Um, sometimes they use different words, but generally it's either HTML or code view. So I really um, encourage you to click on that, especially when things are um, going well, um, you're not trying to troubleshoot, just so you can see what the code looks like. The other thing you can also do with um, is that you can right mouse click. This is on any browser. You can go view page source. 
So the source of the code that runs every web page is open. So that means that if you're um, wanting to get a bit more advanced in this stuff, so I'm not going to go through that stuff, um, just going to do formatting today. You can actually look at a website and figure out how they did it. And so in the early days when I was learning coding around 2000, that's, we'd, we'd go, that website looks cool, and we'd look at the code and figure out how they did it. So I'm just going to scroll down. This is uh, the CSS we can see here. Uh, we keep coming down, blah, blah, blah. But even this doesn't look that complex because look, we've got font awesome, font awesome. So it, you know, it can also make sense. All right, but we're not going to look at that right now. Let's keep going down. Here we go. Here's the code. So if we look here, you can see um, this is a link. And we've got a heading. So I'm going to highlight that. Uh, let me make it bigger. Scroll back down. Okay, so we've got a heading here. And then we've got a link. Um, now, these divs are really important when you're playing with code. So left bracket, div, right bracket. Web developers use uh, the div HTML element for structural stuff. So if we've got three columns, we may have div one, div two, div three. So it's very important if you're playing with a code is if a tag opens, I, then it must close. So you can pretty much do what you want, but as long as you make sure it has an open and close. If you delete the close and it's like three columns, then the code then be, it, it does, the second column doesn't have a start and an end. So then it'll just break your whole layout and you break your website. Um, so just bear that in mind. All right, so enough of looking at the boring code. Let's just jump back. Um, I'm going to jump into um, a free software. So this is the software that I usually use. Um, well, I've just started using. I used to use a more annoying version. Um, SeaMonkey, it's a free open source tool. Um, there's other tools that you can do, like Dreamweaver, um, to, edit, to edit pages, but I find this is much easier. So if you open up SeaMonkey, download it, it's free software. Um, then we go to Window Composer. And I've got a page here already. So this is the page that I'm working on for tomorrow's um, webinar. Um, sneak peek today for the fans out there. Okay, so um, I prefer to write my content in simple code before I then put it into a web page. So yes, WordPress has page editors. Um, every website that you work on has page editors, but I prefer to use them offline. And so if I jump to, here's the normal, this is what you see. And if I jump to HTML, then here we have the code. And yeah, that's gonna let me enlarge. Now good editors make these colorful. Um, so I will also, um, I use other software, um, which will put the color in it, but this one is really good because it then has the view, like normal view. So you can type like a normal web page jump back to the HTML. Okay, but you'll see here, like here's a heading one, bulleted list. So then we can check that it's quite simple. And so I just find that that's um, a lot easier. And then what we can do is then we can copy that in, paste that into a page. Now, you might be, um, going, oh, but why is Glenn teaching us this uh, really boring, nerdy stuff? I'll, I'll run to that. Number one, um, uh, one of the reasons why it's really important is this thing called rubbish code. So I'm just going to go a uh, new page and then I'm going to come to here. This is my WordPress training. Now this is formatted really well um, because I really anal about it. But if I just randomly grab some stuff and then I paste that in, and then I look at the code, look at all that rubbish. This, and, and if you have a look at the thing, see how it's brought in all the formatting and all the colors. Now you don't want to bring in the formatting and colors of another website. So in that context, you need to work out how do you copy and paste text straight that's plain. So sometimes I may, um, just come into, into here and go into the HTML source, just paste the text in like so. So this, there's no formatting now. Then I'll go back to normal and then I'll actually format it. And then, so I'll go uh, heading two, heading one, 
paragraph, we put a bulleted list in, et cetera, et cetera. So then if I look at this code, really nice and clean. Now, how many times have you pasted something from a web page and it's the wrong font or it's the wrong color and you're like, how do I, it won't fix. And you're clicking on the color button and you're trying to change the color and it just won't do it. That is because there's some rubbish code in there. So I'm hoping back to the bonnet analogy of your car, you can lift up the bonnet, have a look at the HTML and then go, oh, okay. Um, that bit that says color equals shouldn't be there. And simple is best. So this is an unordered list. It doesn't need all that fancy stuff. So you you can, um, with confidence, actually delete all the other stuff and just keep it as clean and minimal as possible. All right, so now I'm just gonna jump to why I started nerding out on you um, and back to the run sheet. So um, being able to debug for rubbish code is really important. Uh, and also with rubbish code that when you, also when you're pasting, um, on a Mac, there's a shortcut that you can paste without formatting. And there's um, different tools that you can use to paste without formatting. So in that example, I showed you how to do that in text mode. Uh, as a web developer, I always have a, a text editor, which just does, 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 does has no formatting. So that's, I use BB Edit on a Mac. Um, Notepad++ on a PC will also do that. So there's no formatting. So that means you can paste text in there and actually um, write text without formatting. So generally when I'm writing content, I will always start with just writing the content. I don't do any layout, any formatting. Um, here's my headings, here's my paragraphs. This, is, this will be a bulleted list. And then I paste it into the final software, whether that's WordPress or some other web, um, website, and then I'll format it as the last thing. Because formatting, um, formatting um, definitely gets in the way um, for writing. And then, um, for example, if you're pasting out a word, then all that formatting will come. These are static pages you're building. Um, yes, but these are pages that are going into a content management system like WordPress or something. Um, Sublime text, is a text editor like um, so how about sublime text well it depends what you're using it for um, yes sublime text will give you a um, html editor and it'll give you the pretty colors as well um, but i'm not sure does it have a view screen or not but i mean it doesn't matter what tool you use the the really important thing is that you're not scared of the, the code and it, and i'm not talking about programming here just basic formatting code and then you can um um, then we can go to the next step. So here's the reason why. Cross-platform. So in the old days, we used to um, view our websites on a laptop, um, not even a laptop, on a desktop. And then there was about two screen sizes. And it was very simple. So we'd build websites to fit that screen. Now we've got phones, we've got internet watches, we've got people who view the internet on their PlayStation. We have internet enabled fridges. We have like all sorts of weird and wonderful devices. Now we can't as um, designers design for all these platforms. So what we do is if we, um, some, if we format our code correctly using semantic markup, heading ones, heading twos, paragraphs, bulleted lists, then that would then format across any platform that you throw it at. If you look at an internet watch and you formatted your um, copy correctly um, without all the rubbish, then it will display as best as possible on an internet watch, even though you're not testing for it. So this is a key thing is that it will cross platform um, very well. It will also future proof your code and your pages. So for example, 2021, they released the hologram, um, web page reader like they have in Star Wars um, when Princess Layla gave that message to Luke Skywalker. Now that's not too far off because we already have voice technology um, and hologram technology is coming really fast. So let's just say it's coming out next year, but we don't know what the specifications are for the hologram web page reader. Um, so what do we do? If we use basic semantic markup, then the people who design and develop the um, holographic um, web page reader, 
if there are any decent developers, they will optimize the web page for semantic markup, the standards that exist across the internet. So they'll optimize for a heading one, they'll optimize for a paragraph, they optimize for a bulleted list. So therefore, your web page is gonna display perfectly in a technology that's not even invented yet. Um, the other benefits of um, semantic markup is um, designing for disability. Um, screen readers are robots and they read out to the person and um, voice. Um, so voice search is really important now. So, um, hey Google, that's a voice search. So if you semantically mark up your pages, it means a robot can read them to a person. So they can go, hey Google, what's the best, um, can you tell me about the Gippsland Forests um, campaign where it's up to? Google will then go to your web page because it's the best web page on the internet. It's done it through your search rankings and then it just starts reading the page. Uh, the campaign is up to this. Um, this isn't the future, this is where it's all at the moment. But while we're talking about semantic markup, this is talking about optimizing for Google. Google is a robot. So talk to it in its language, which is semantic markup. Um, and then as a, an extra email also uses HTML. It uses a crude application, and that's mainly because of Microsoft refused to update their technologies generally. So uh, email is a rough version of HTML. So if you're sending out email newsletters um, and you're having problems with the formatting, um, if you, they also have a code button that you can go in and have a look at the code and fix that up. And more importantly, now you're gonna be thinking about how can I have this as minimal as possible before you write email and you'll write email, then you'll format it in their software so that the headings and the, the stuff's optimized for their platform. Okay, so that was talking about optimizing copy for semantics. Now I'm gonna talk about optimizing for humans because Google's looking for the best content for humans. TLDR, no, someone sends me a long email, a long text message, I reply, reply with TLDR. It was too long, I didn't read. Um, so that's really common now. So the human, the brain is changing, social media and the way we consume media is changing quite fast. So I would argue that long form is dead. So um, long articles, um, long detailed information, that's dead. Now this is in context to uh, a quick turnaround and search optimization, that sort of stuff. Sure, if you're doing extensive research um, as an academic, then long form is, is always gonna be around. However, um, generally people will come to a short form, even a really short form as a meme, bit more, a bit more, a bit more before they're even going into a long form. By the time we get into long form, I'd argue also that web pages aren't a good format for long form anyway, because um, therefore you're staring at a screen. It's better to then be in an EPUB format, an electronic book, because then it can go into your tablet reader, your um, Amazon um, book reader, um, in my case on my phone. Now in an EPUB context, that means I can increase the font size, I can increase the contrast, I can control it, um, and a lot of them have screens which are better for reading. So I'd also argue that um, long form shouldn't be on web pages anyway. Obviously there is context, but um, if you think of it that way. The other um, way to think about it is that we should be able to read your web page without reading it. Okay, so the way that works is that you have lots of subheadings, headings, subheadings, sub subheadings, where you've got the key points and then paragraphs. So that means that I can scan your page and get the gist of it without reading it. So that's really important as well because I might be like, oh, I'm looking for something specific. So is there a current campaign in Gibbland's Forest? Don't make me read from the front of the top of the page down to the bottom of the page with this big long text. Cut it up, put subheadings so I can scan it and go, I don't care about this, but I don't care. I don't care. Oh, here's the bit. Oh, no. Oh, here's the bit I want. Bang paragraph and I'm going to read that one paragraph. So we, um, what about blogs, TLDR, definitely. Um, you can also use a format that newspapers have always used, which is the pyramid way of writing. So you have the who, what, why, when, the important stuff right at the top, short form. Then you do a bit more longer, a bit more detail, and then you, you go into your long form. So there is still a place for long form, but I would also ask the question, 
is this relevant to what you're doing? Um, is it relevant to getting a call to action to get your people to the next point? Um, maybe it's you want them to download an EPUB, we talked about um, pathways earlier, uh, or maybe you want them to get to an, come to an event where you can give them more information, etc. Um, so you want to be able to scan to read. Um, so lots of subheadings. Um, the other thing is, can it be better in a bulleted list? So if you can even get away with getting rid of your paragraphs, then get rid of your paragraphs. Um, and you want short paragraphs. So I, I read an article the other day, I linked to it on Facebook. Um, it was an interesting article. I scanned it and they had big long paragraphs. And I was like, really? Do you want, you don't want me to read this, do you? Because it's actually hurt some your eyes to be able to um, just go slabs of text. Uh, makes It's easier to read if you've got breaks. Now, we're not having to worry about printing paper. We're not having to worry about the cost. So in the old days, they used to bunch things up to print less paper. The books were cheaper to produce. We don't have to worry about that. Heaps of spacing, heaps of paragraphs. Make it a nice experience for people to read it. Um, so I'm just going to show an example um, of that. Um, where'd my browser go? There it is. All right, so this is my web page. I've optimized WordPress training. Heading, small paragraph, small paragraph. Heading, small paragraph, small paragraph, small paragraph. Call to action, there's a pretty picture. Sub dot, you get that all the way down. Now, the, the longest bits of copy on my entire website are my testimonials. Um, with my new website, I've even cut them back. Um, there we go. Take control of your blog. You don't need to read about the technology, the, that paragraph. It makes sense. Build a successful website for a living, plan a new website, beginners welcome. Like you can scan that section without having to read it um, really quickly. Um, blah, blah, blah. Okay, get away the bullets at least, far better. Okay. So this is um, way to optimize. Now the reason I'm saying this for humans, but it's also um, Google is going to also um, penalize you, um, will, will reward you for writing like that because Google gets it. Google is writing for uh, optimizing for people and Google understands that if people are searching for things, they just want to get to where they're going as quick as they can. Um, so short paragraphs, headings, subheadings, bulleted lists. And that goes back to our previous bit about semantic markup. If you've got um, it in that format marked up correctly, it's um, the best format for Google. And optimizing for other. Images are also important for search optimization. So, and um, so if you're searching for Gippsland Forest to actually have um, photos for Gippsland Forest. Now, when you're optimizing photos, the, the file name is important. So if you just have untitled screenshot underscore zero zero, doesn't mean anything. But if you've got Gippsland dash forest dot JPEG is the file name, then you've uploaded it. And there's also a thing called alt text, which your code editor should let you put an alternative text. This is the text that loads when the image doesn't load. Good for screen readers, but it's also important for search search engines. Now there's some really good opportunity for search um, searching for images. How many times have you searched for an image? Gone to Google, image search. That's a search engine. So you also optimize all your images. Somebody might be researching the Gippsland Forest and they go, I want a picture of the Gippsland Forest. So they search for Gippsland Forest. And if your pages, if your um, images come up first, they then click that link to your web page. Um, and an example of using that in a campaign context, there was this awful man called John Gay. And he used to run a um, company called Guns. And they used to smash a lot of Tasmania's old growth forest. So I painted a portrait of John Gay um, with my artist hat on. And he was on his knees eating forest and he was shooting out $50 notes. And so what I did is I optimized for John Gay. Um, I optimized the pages, I optimized the um, images. Now, when you searched for John Gay as an image search, I'm not sure what it's doing now, but for many years, there was a famous poet from the 1800s called John Gay. Famous poet used to get the first six searches. Then they were all my pictures. 
And then after my pictures were pictures of this person, John Gay. So in that context, I can pretty be sure that this man has seen this painting that I painted of him to uh, mock him. So in that context, we can also be quite creative in the way of do, using uh, image searches for our campaigns. Um, for another example is with um, Moore's Creek, when we're at the Laird Blockade, we would optimize our images for our, um, our, uh, our foe, which was Whitehaven Coal, who was destroying our forest. So we would optimize all our images, Whitehaven Coal, Whitehaven Coal. So that when people search for Whitehaven Coal, i.e. investors or other people that were looking at, is it a good idea to give them money? It would come up with all this protest um, imagery and that hopefully they'd go, oh, I don't want to invest in that. That's just a bit like whatever. So yeah, uh, it's important to think about images. Page speed is also crucial. Um, Google now um, says that if it's slow to download, it's annoying, which is true. Um, if it's slow, it's not the best page on the internet for Gippsland Forest, which is true. Um, so we will be doing um, page speed optimization in later web, web um, webinars. Um, but there are plenty of tests on your web pages um, and keep them lean. And the other is cross platform. So there's a concept called responsive web design. And that just means that when you resize the window, it just changes its layout. Now this is standard on all websites these days. So if your website is doesn't do that, then you get a website that does. That's really important. It should be pretty standard these days. So just test that your website works for mobiles and tablets. And then when you're writing your content and building your web pages, just test that they are they do work well on a web on a on a mobile, because um, Google may rank you high for your web page, but on a mobile it may also then rank you low. So for you to be ranked high on a mobile search, it needs to be optimized for mobile. That sort of thing. So keep that keep that in mind. Okay, so now I'm going to jump. Um, so a lot of my webinars um, in the future are going to focus on WordPress. Um, and uh, I'll talk about why in those webinars, but I'm just going to jump now to, to a tool in WordPress called Yoast, which is um, which is there to help us optimize um, some of this theory that I've been talking about. Now, if you're using another tool um, that's not WordPress, then there should be tools like this that help you. So um, even if you're not on WordPress, then the, the tool going through this process should be helpful because then hopefully you can find a tool that will work. So I'm just share screen again. Share. Okay, so this is this page here um, that's, that's optimized. So I'm just going to jump to this. Now, um, we're using a Divi here if you're WordPress people and wondering what that is. Anyway, I'm going to jump down, scroll down. Um, so this is the Yoast section. And oh, actually before I, I, so this is the Yoast section. So here's where I put in my keyword. Okay, so it's got WordPress Training Melbourne is my keyword. So here we go, it's an SEO analysis and I'm getting a little orange, like, yeah, it's okay, it's not great. So this was optimized heavily um, uh, six months ago, four months ago, and I got a nice green happy face. And so now even in six months, things have changed and it's not so happy. Um, so I'm just going to just run through through what's doing here. It's saying key phrase density. The key phrase was found three times. We recommend that you have it four times for this amount of length of text. Okay, so that's great. The robot's helping me here, so I just put the keyword in there somewhere. Um, you've used this key phrase more than two times before. What that's talking about is on other web pages. So what Google wants is it wants one page for that keyword. It doesn't want multiple pages. Now use that with a grain of salt because if your um, whole campaign's on Gippsland Forest, then it's obvious you can have multiple pages on Gippsland Forest. So key phrase and subheading. So we're talking about heading, heading ones, heading twos, heading threes. It wants to see more, um, key, more of your keyword in, that, in the subheadings. Okay, so I've got an outbound link. So apparently it likes outbound links. Internal links, so internal links are in your website. So these are really useful. So if you've got other pages, you can then link to your page using your keyword. Key phrase and introduction, key phrase length, they're all good. Um, meta description, I'll show you that in a little bit. Uh, that as well. Image alt text, I talked about that before. It's good job. Google thinks that 
there's certain size of pages that it likes, it prefers. Then back to when I was talking about short form or long form. Um, key phrase in title, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and SEO title width. Key phrase and slug, I'll talk about that a bit. So basically it's just going through a lot of those theories and then saying yes, no, maybe that's really good. So I'll just jump up to here. The three most important things on SEO, um, uh, let me just show you the page. I'll load, reload this page. Is this URL here? The heading one, the most important, um, most in the, the first heading. And you can't quite see, um, hopefully you see it on your screen, but this is the page title at the top. So if you see the rollover it says WordPress Training Melbourne. So WordPress Training Melbourne, WordPress Training Melbourne, WordPress Training Melbourne. So those three um, uh, attributes are the most important for optimizing for Google because they're, um, they're the hardest to gain. That, this page is obviously about WordPress Training Melbourne because the heading, the two titles and the URL on that. So first step is to put in your URL and the page title, the keyword. Now WordPress, when you put it as the page title, it automatically makes those three things that. So um, you can also edit your URL. So that's what um, that was saying there before. My key phrase in title, key phrase in um, the URL, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so you can play with this um, in your own time. So I'm just gonna jump now to readability and it's got a really sour face now. So here's the things that this robot, um, it, this robot's judging my writing. Um, so do take it with a grain of salt because it is a robot. Now transition words, it wants more transition words. So good point, I can probably put some more in there. Um, now this Fletch, uh, reading ease text is a useful one. So I went to a talk by about copywriting from someone that worked at the Herald Sun. And most, um, most of Murdoch's um, um, newspapers are written to the comprehension of a 12 year old. So in that context, they want people, um, people with low um, English apprehension, um, low ability to read, English as a second language, all those things to be able to read their articles. So they don't use any big words. They don't use any complex theories. Um, so it's written for that. So this Fletch reading ease is a little bit like that. So it's just saying, well, this is too complex and too hard. So I should simplify my language, less jargon, that sort of thing. Now, if you're optimizing for medical equipment, then I'd say ignore that. Because if your target audience is doctors or people that buy medical equipment, I'm sure they understand the jargon and they are expecting the technical descriptions of medical oils. They're probably the wrong people to be reading your webpage anyway. So um, always put in context to your audience about um, the ability to read it. But because my, um, my courses are aimed at beginners, then I reckon that I should take that on. Subheading distribution. One section is longer than 300 words and not separated by subheadings. So back to when I was saying, make it scannable. Lots of subheadings. Google is saying, I need lots of subheadings. Um, I've got a passive voice. Um, there's enough variety in my sentences. None of the paragraphs are too long. So all this stuff that I was talking about is, is what Google wants and Google's short sentences. Cool. So while we're here, um, we are optimizing for, um, we are optimizing for Google. Um, however, we will also jump in here while we're here and just show you. We can also optimize uh, this for Facebook um, and other social media. Specifically, we can choose the image that shares when we share it um, on Facebook. If I jump back to SEO, I'm going to look at the preview, which I uh, missed before. So I'm going to click on preview. Now this is the um, preview, the, um, the snippet that we talked about before. So this is what's displayed when someone searches for um, your term on the, on the Google page. So that's back here. This is this bit here I went through before. So this is really important. So we also need our keywords. So you can see here, I've got WordPress Training Melbourne at the top. My URL is WordPress Training Melbourne. And then 
putting WordPress training Melbourne in the first paragraph. That's actually copyright. That was hard to write copywriting because generally it's like Melbourne WordPress training, but to put WordPress training Melbourne in a sentence was actually pretty hard. So, um, so we've got the keywords in there. It's optimized for robots with the keywords, but also optimized for humans. So hopefully that's emotive enough and exciting enough for people to go, yeah, click on that. And so you can click on that and edit it. And it's also got this green line to help you adjust the widths and all that sort of stuff. So in that context, for any page that you care about, um, as far as your optimization, you should be optimizing the content as well as your snippet, images, uh, URL, title, all that stuff. Now, if, you've, if, this, if you, this is the first thing you've ever heard about search optimization, it may feel a bit overwhelming. Um, but once you start getting the flow of it, it's actually just the basics. Like, what am I going to what am I going to call this page? Well, let's think about it. Just write with paragraphs. Um, okay, I've published my page. Let's just check out the Yoast settings and tweak with them a bit. Done. So, so it once you you get the basics, it's actually it does become quite easy. And then also, as I started and introduced this webinar with, is it's just as easy and quick to do it than not to do it. So if you're adding a new page, it's just as quick to optimize it as it is not to. Um, so why wouldn't you? Um, and then also Yoasty also has um, some other um, settings, which we'll go through. Um, now remember that um, the, this Yoast is another robot that's judging what another robot would think. So bear that in mind because the ultimate people are humans. So if you uh, understand what you're doing and you and you disagree with Yoast, then definitely do what you think. All right. Um, now, search appearance here on the left. This will allow you to optimize your entire web page for um, Google. So I'm not going to go into detail. I just wanted to give you an introduction to this tool and what these sort of tools would do. Um, also, it will allow you to set the default images for um, for your um, different social media. So um, this is really good to do because if you haven't um, put in a custom image for your social media share, then you can set a default one, which is really useful. Um, okay, now with your social media, when you share um, something onto Facebook, it will cache it. So what um, Facebook also um, crawls the internet um, more than if someone shares on it. So if someone shared your page before, then when you share that link again, it will show the old version. So if you've updated the image and you've gone, oh, I didn't know about this, and then you go back and optimize your page and put a nice Facebook graphic, you'll need to clear the cache. So if you search for um, Facebook cache or Facebook debugger, then you can actually um, get to this page which will allow you to clear the cache. So I can just stick this in here and hit debug. And then this will show the description, the image that I'm using, um, and then I can hit scrape again. So this was April 26th was when it was um, scraped. Oh, that's not long ago. Did someone share me? That's great. Um, and so then I can then um, update it. So that's a really useful, um, to have. Okay, so we're cruising now. Now the, the final um, thing that I wanna talk about is the Google Search Console and the um, XML sitemaps. So let me jump into Search Console, which is different to Google Analytics. Um, we went through Google Analytics yesterday, um, so I'm not gonna go through that now. This is, this used to be called Webmaster Tools. And let me see, hopefully I'm logged in with the right account. Um, oh yeah, Upskill Coach, here we go. All right, so what this is, is this is, um, so I introduced how um, search engines work by they crawl the internet. Now what Google and other search terms have gone, well, all these people want to optimize what we can do is we can make it easy for them and easy for us. So this is a system where you can send your website to Google to increase its indexing. 
Um, now, what we want to send to Google is what we call an XML sitemap. Now, I want you to think about this as your website that's been processed down into baby food. Um, so that way, Google can digest it really easily. Okay, so that analogy again is we're getting your whole website and we're going to um, filter it down to the simplest format possible. Then Google will eat more of it and you'll get more indexed. This is called XML. And basically, it's just a um, shortened version of uh, like a condensed version. So um, I'm not going to go through XMLs, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you. Um, we go to Yoast General and then we go to Sitemaps. And we're going to click on this and we're going to see our sitemap. And here we go. This is what a sitemap looks like. Um, and if I click on one, it will look. Um, keep going. So it sees all the pages when they've last modified, all that sort of stuff. So this make, just makes it easy for Google. So then what we can do is we just grab that and we copy it. Now in WordPress, if this sitemap doesn't work, switch this on and off. Because sometimes uh, Yoast is buggy when it's first installed. So you switch it on and off. If that doesn't work, um, then switch it off and switch it back on and come down to settings, um, settings, permalinks. And then click just save, just save on this page. Because what that does is then resets the permalinks, which is the URLs of the website, which will then reset this URL we've got here and get it working again. So there's a tip for you. All right, so let's come to here, sitemaps. And I've already, I've already added mine. And so then I submit it and then just, I'll hit my uh, sitemap here, hit submit. And then Google will, um, this just injects your website straight into Google's belly, which is really great. Um, so it's, um, if you don't do this, Google will find you eventually with its crawler, but this is far more efficient, especially if you're launching a website and you want to get it indexed straight away. Now, sometimes this will say it's broken. Um, there's nothing you can do about that. Just double check that, that it's there. Um, it's, uh, I've double checked that. Um, double check that you've got the address right. Once you've done that, um, you just have to wait a few days. It's just a, a bug with Google. And what they're saying is now it's, it's indexed 108 of my pages, which is great. Um, then we can come back to coverage and we've got one error. We can see what's happening. So it's 92 pages that's indexed. I can also inspect um, specific pages for issues and I can also ask Google to re-index them. So in that context, um, let me just do that. So just say I've, upda I've updated, done, I've gone right, I've spent a whole heap of time updating my Google optimization on this page. I can then, um, so this was crawled, it's not telling me when. Um, last crawl is on the 20th of April, so um, that's quite a while away. Um, it's mobile friendly, da da da. So I can click request indexing. So it, that doesn't mean Google's going to index it, but it, you're asking it nicely and Google will, will more likely um, index it. So that means if you've optimized your page, then it can get um, indexed quicker. Um, and then there's also a few tests and a few other things you can do in here as well. Um, you can look at your link backs and all that sort of stuff. So this is a very useful tool to um, help optimize your website. Now, other search engines also have this equivalent tool. I generally um, a bit lazy and only plug into Google because it's such a big one. But if you're um, running a bigger campaign, then I would look at Bing's um, search console and the other, other search engines. Any questions? So that is my overview on um, search marketing. And um, so I just uh, closed by saying yesterday I was really excited. Um, I had some donations come in, um, which helps me um, continue offering free content. Um, if that's not your thing, um, please share my stuff. Write me a review on Facebook or comment on um, uh, comment on the videos that all helps get my stuff out there. Um, that'd be really appreciated. 